I attempted a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Let's Go using only Poison types. With only 153 Pokemon available plus Alolan forms, there's quite a good number of encounters to work with in this typing. In Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee respectively, we've got Vileplume or Victory Bell, Nidoking, Nidoqueen, Beedrill, Venusaur, Arbok only an Eevee, Golbat, Venomoth, Gengar, Tentacruel, and Muck or Weezing. Having access to the Grass, Bug, Ground, Flying, Ghost, Water, and even the Dark subtypings thanks to Alolan Muck, I think we have a comfortable amount of encounters, and even have coverage against a major weakness in ground types thanks to Golbat, though Psychic will still be very tough considering how late Alolan Muck is available. Will they be enough? We'll have to see. But first, make sure to subscribe to the channel as we're just 7,100 subscribers away from my 2023 goal of 200,000. Like this video, and leave a comment below what other monotype hardcore nuzlocks you'd like to see that haven't been completed yet. Which if you're curious about, I have a spreadsheet with links to all completed monotype hardcore nuzlocks done in the mainline Pokemon games in the description in case you're curious about what has and hasn't been done. But with that, rules are in the description with one addition for Let's Go. No stat boosting candies or species specific candies. Sure, it's funny to watch a single oddish steamroll this game, but I want a challenge, so let's jump right in. So for the third run in a row that I've done in these games, I'm again using Let's Go Pikachu since Arbok without Intimidate is practically useless. Vileplume's just better than Victory Bell, and Muck is only available in Pikachu, and I really want that dark typing or else I am going to be in a very rough spot for stuff like Sabrina and Agatha. So with our useless Pikachu in hand, it's time for encounters. The first two are available before the first rival battle in Oddish on Route 1 and Nidoran Male on Route 22, which thankfully popped up first instead of Nidoran Female, since the other will only be available on Route 9 only after getting chopped down, and the stronger ground type before Lieutenant Surge is going to be paramount to beating him easily. With them at level 7 though, Trace's Eevee is swiftly taken down by Oddish using 4 absorbs through a few tackles and a growl to take the win. But that's not it for encounters before Brock, as there's two more to handle. Weedle's available over on Route 2, and Bulbasaur is available in Viridian Forest, which actually popped up without me needing to chain anything to get the spawn to pop up. Very handy in terms of how much time it takes to record these runs. Then again, Let's Go only takes me around 8 to 10 hours max to complete with research, moveset optimizations, and fight strategies, not including scripting and actually voicing over these videos, so I can't say that's very much time at all, that's why you're going to be seeing a lot of these going into December to hopefully finish out the types that could be feasibly able to clear this game from the beginning, but I digress. With these four at level 12 though, it's a pretty simple endeavor to take on Brock as he leads with Geodude, I lead Bulbasaur, and while I do take a turn to set up with Leech Seed against Geodude, it's not like it matters very much as it only does 6 damage with Tackle, healing back 3 from Leech Seed, and taking it out next turn with Vine Whip, leaving just Onyx. Headbutt is scary since it outspeeds, but it doesn't flinch as Vine Whip does half, with Rock Throw bringing Bulbasaur to just below half as the second Vine Whip thankfully doesn't miss the range to KO, taking out Onyx and giving me the boulder badge. As expected, this was not too bad, and Misty should also not be too bad considering the only psychic type move that Starmie has access to is Psy Wave, which can't do super effective damage. Next up on the docket of encounters just beyond Route 3 is in Mount Moon with Zubat, giving us our integral ground type pivot that I need to preserve at all costs. The Giovanni fights, a few of Lance's Pokemon with Earthquake, as well as Trace's Marowak are all pretty threatening throughout this playthrough, so it'll be integral to keep this alive, regardless of how terrible it is with its modest nature. While I am disappointed with that, our special attack will be higher than our physical attack more and more the further we get into this playthrough, and moves like Air Slash and later Sludge Bomb by TM being available, I'll at least have good attacking options along with healing with Roost and status with Confuse Ray. With five Pokemon in hand though, it's a quick trek through the cave, only being stopped by Jesse and James at the end, and thanks to our typing, we're able to negate most of the damage and status that Coughing and Ekans can inflict, giving me more than enough leeway to lay into them with Zubat and Beedrill, using a myriad of Wing Attack and Headbutt respectively to take out Ekans in one turn, doing the same volley at Coughing for two turns in a row to take it out and leave unharmed. Upon entry into Cerulean City though, I made sure to evolve Bulbasaur into Ivysaur, as well as Nidoran into Nidorino, and finally Nidoking to give me a wealth of advantage against Trace, especially considering Nidoking learns Thrash upon evolution, giving me access to a 120 power normal type move that'll come in mighty handy. 
Not necessarily at the beginning of the fight though, as he has three Pokemon, and I don't want to succumb to fatigue. So I decide to just volley headbutt at Pidgey, barely missing the KO as Gust hits for minimal damage. Now that I have him heal locked with a potion, I hit two more headbutts to KO. Second out is Oddish, and I may as well stay the course so I can hit double kick on the Eevee after, and two headbutts is more than enough to seal the deal, leaving just Eevee to be one shot by the two hits of double kick to win the fight in short order. Well, at least Thrash came in handy for the trainers up through Bill, considering it was one-shotting everything in sight, but with them taken care of, I can finally fill the last member of my team. No, not you, Psyduck, though you do help in capturing 50 Pokemon to enter Koga's gym. Uh, seriously, that's probably the biggest time drainer of the run, is having to capture 50 different Pokemon just to be able to challenge the gym. But on Route 24, I'm finally able to capture my encounter in Venonat. And while it won't be able to evolve until level 31, and therefore won't be too useful until then, this is a Pokemon that gets access to Quiver Dance, and therefore should be extremely helpful in setup sweeps against the Elite Four, as it only learns it right at the level cap of 55. Also, again with the terrible natures, Adamant on Venonat makes it much worse to use for special sweeping as natures impact the small boosts you get from level ups in this game, which in case you didn't know basically are the very limited sort of quote unquote EVs you can get in this game, similar to stat boosting candies, but considering these happen naturally, this isn't something I can necessarily get rid of. But with an Adamant nature, that means I won't get a single point in special attack. Instead, those will be going into physical attack, which is the same case for Zubat, just swapped, hence why the special attack stat on it is going to be much higher than the physical later we get into the run. Nerdy explanations aside, with the SS ticket in hand, it's time for Misty. She leads Psyduck, I lead Ivysaur, and it's Vine Whip time, baby. Hitting for over half damage on turn one as Confusion does slightly less than a quarter, allowing for me to hit a second next turn to KO and lead into Starmie. Here I'm getting off a Leech Seed in case things go downhill, but she's not using Scald since it's resisted. Instead, using Swift, which is fine since I'm just going to Sleep Powder it anyway, but I do miss the first one as the second connects following another Swift, and I'm finally able to lay in with two Vine Whips all while she remains asleep to KO and win the fight. Good stuff! Can't complain about taking out a team of Psychic coverage and a powerful Psychic type in Starmie with just one unevolved Pokemon. It really is crazy that they just hand Misty a stone evolution, by the way, and give it Scald and call it the second gym leader. You would never see that in any other Pokemon game of this day, and yet people continue to call this game baby's first Pokemon. With two badges in hand, though, I'm finally given access to South of Cerulean City, but first, of course, the TM for Dig. 80 power, stab ground move for Nidoking, just in time for Lieutenant Surge. Don't mind if I do. Not much else to mention though outside of getting the team up to level 24 in preparation for the Trace fight on SSN, holding off on Oddish's evolution until level 22 so that it learns Mega Drain before evolving into Gloom. I mean, may as well, the 75 power attack over the 40 power absorb is much better and Gloom doesn't get it until a few levels later. Anyway, Trace is again at the end of the SSN and ready for a thrashing. Except I'm a stupid idiot and decide to click Dig against his lead Pidgeotto, instead of moving to double kick like I initially wanted to, taking an extra wing attack like a foolish amphibian before laying in with a double kick for around 40%, but after seeing sand attack, I'm kind of just disinterested at this point, going for thrashing, hitting it to KO, as well as hitting not one, but two of them on Eevee through a super potion before fatigue sets in. Not a problem though, I stay in with the amount of HP I have, hitting myself once in the face of two quick attacks, finally finishing it off with double kick before Onish comes out, and gets massacred by two uses of thrash to win me the fight. Hey, another single-handed win. Gotta love stone evolutions. But of course, we need to thrash this Alolan ambassador back to the Assland, using Beedrill in literally its first major battle to take out Jigglypuff in a single poison jab, then doing it to Mr. Mime with two of them following a Reflect and Psy Wave to win the fight. I will continue to bash the Alola games until the end of time. Either that or I finally get the courage to finish the Ultra Sun and Moon Professor Oaks challenge, but that won't be for a good long while, I can imagine. Anyway, one trash can puzzle and Nidoking King lead later and Surge is basically toast. Being hit by a very light Swift as Voltorb goes down next turn to Dig, leading to Magnemite who doesn't even get a single attack off before going down, leaving just Raichu to hit again a light quick attack, not even pulling Nidoking King below three quarters as Dig one shots and wins me the fight, as well as the TM for Thunderbolt. Hmm, good coverage for Nidoking King until we get access to Thunder Punch in Saffron City. Don't mind if I do. 
Now with three badges in hand, I've got to go out of my way to grab that free leaf stone on Route 2, as well as grab the light up secret technique, which my stupid idiot moron brain decided to skip over and just try heading back through Diglett's cave instead of actually receiving the move, remembering before being brought back to Cerulean for free by Trace. Seriously, this kind of thing before getting access to fly is a godsend, making getting through the game faster if it weren't for my stupidity. But hey, at least now I can capture a Nidoran female on Route 9, so we've got a backup encounter, which we don't really get very often in these Let's Go runs considering there's so few Pokemon available. One mapless rock tunnel later and we've arrived on the other side into Lavender Town, ready to take on another rival fight after bringing the team to level 30 in Pokemon Tower. Once again, we're leading Nidoking against Pidgeotto, but this time not being a moron, instead one-shotting it with Thunderbolt as Gloom enters next, two-shotting it with Dig while taking a light Razor Leaf. This just leaves Jolteon, which hits Quick Attack and then goes down to a single Dig to win. It's pretty refreshing not having to worry about this thing like I did in the Flying-type run. Not having something like Gligar for the immunity in that run made it such a stupidly tough time trying to complete. But I'd still highly suggest checking it out if you haven't already, since it seems like not very many people that are subscribed to the channel have. Though I think that just might be the consensus among people thinking that, again, Let's Go is baby's first Pokemon. And them not understanding how hard these games can be with the expanded move pool, more competent AI, and lack of using candies on any of these Pokemon. But again, I digress. Link will be in the iCard on the top right hand corner of the video. But with Trace taken down, it's a quick trip through the underground path into Celadon City, giving me access to our next gym battle in Erica after bringing up the team to level 34. The level cap here is also great since I get to evolve the majority of my team, except for Gloom. I still don't know why I haven't evolved Gloom yet, though I think it's because I just haven't had to use it since the team is already so diverse with Nidoking. Beedrill, Golbat, Venusaur, and Venomoth being so good already, especially the last one after picking up the TM for Psychic in Saffron City. Anyway, Erica time, and if you've seen the Flying-type Nuzlocke already, you'll be pretty familiar with how effective Golbat is at walling against your team and how much damage we can deal out with... Uh, wing Attack. Eh, it's not really that good this time around, though it's still the strategy I'm going with since I can use my other team members as Plan B and Beyond if needed. She leads Tangela, I go with Golbat's Wing Attack, doing only about a third as she misses Sleep Powder, but the second hits as she starts going for Mega Drain, doing more damage than I would have expected for a quad-resisted attack. Huh, I guess my special defense and HP IVs are pretty bad. However, that's not enough to keep her from losing to two Leech Lifes after I wake up, getting back most of that HP as Vileplume comes in second, attempting to wail on Golbat with Moonblast, but thanks to Confuse Ray, we're able to get her to successfully hit herself twice in a row, with the second KOing Vileplume in addition to two Wing Attack connections to leave just Weepin' Bell. Now, of course, the not fully evolved Weepin' Bell is pretty pitiful, nearly falling to Wing Attack as Poison Jab does next to nothing, KOing next turn to win, and net me both the Rainbow Badge and TM for Mega Drain. Hmm, yet another TM that's useful for not only Venusaur and Gloom, but also as coverage on my special attacking Golbat in place of Leech Life. Don't mind if I do. By the way, if you're enjoying the video so far, do take a quick moment and click the like button as well as check if you're subscribed. People tend to forget about those things a ton, but they help the channel immensely at no cost to you. And for full transparency, that goal of 200,000 subscribers by the end of 2023 is only going to happen if I average about 250 new subscribers a day for the rest of the year, which I think is definitely possible with a few seconds of your time. Now with the first four badges that are rather well spaced out, it's time to take out all those story events in a row before the barrage of the last four gym leaders, with a plethora of encounters being available during this time as well. In fact, all of our remaining ones throughout the entire game are available once we get the last few secret techniques. Which, fun fact, are not tied to gym badges in this game. I thought they were tied to them just like they were in RBY as well as Fire Red Leaf Green, and I'm surprised I completely forgot that they aren't. I mean, considering I did do the Professor Oak's challenge for this game years ago, I probably should know this, but... And again, that was literally four years ago at this point. Jeez, September 2019? It really was over four years ago. Still can't believe this channel is going as strong as it is this far into my time doing these challenges, and glad people are still interested in them. Side note, I suppose while going through the Rocket Hideout, I do fear that sometime within the next year or two that people are just going to start becoming less and less interested in these types of videos, especially considering how few Monotype Hardcore Nuzlocke's that are left incomplete at this point in time. 
But hey, I'm sure I can do something dumb like, uh, I don't know, history of Pokemon Crystal speedrun world records or something. I got the blessing from Summoning Salt actually years back after showing him some runs of Red and Blue that dated back to 2004 that he didn't cover in his video a couple years back on the games. With him replying that he just didn't grow up with the game, so he wasn't as passionate about it, so he gave me the go-ahead of using the format for other Pokemon games, though I'm sure that'll be a very long-term project. Holy moly, I got sidetracked there for a second. Anyway, Rocket Hideout goes well, including the Jesse and James fight, where I used Nidoking and Venomoth's super effective Dig and Psychic respectively, to tear through Arbok in a single turn, doing the same to Weezing on the next turn with Thrash and Psychic to KO and win the fight. Archer goes pretty simply as well, leading Weezing as I continue to lead with Nidoking, using Dig and outspeeding his flamethrower misses, with it only hitting for about a quarter as the second Dig KOs leading to Golbat. Of course, we still have Thunderbolt, and since we're faster, there's no hope for him to flinch with Air Slash, KOing with the second, and winning the battle. Giovanni's all that remains here, but once again, is pretty easy with a lead of Persian against, you guessed it, Nidoking, using Double Kick after taking a Fake Out for over half damage, dodging a Slash by the power of Friendship, and then taking a non-crit one before using my second Double Kick to KO and lead into Rhyhorn. Now this thing has Drill Run, which is disastrous for anything on my team not named Golbat, However, with that rock typing, we also need a move to KO in one shot, and Mega Drain's the perfect out. Using the quad effective attack to KO in one shot with our superior special attack to win the fight. Well then, I guess special attack in Golbat is actually better than I would have thought. But we're not done yet with rocket fights, as we still need to head to the top of the Pokemon Tower to retrieve the Pokey Flute from Mr. Fuji, grabbing our encounter in Ghastly before taking on Jesse and James yet again. Now, again with the power of Nidoking and Venomoth, I'm able to overpower them with the likes of Dig and Psychic. Using the combo on turn 1 against Arbok, getting hit with Glare on Venomoth afterwards, as well as a Dark Pulse from Weezing missing as Nidoking's underground, allowing for Dig to KO Arbok next turn as Weezing hits Dark Pulse for less than a quarter on Venomoth, hitting Psychic for half and breaking out of Paralysis due to the power of Friendship. Makes my life easy as Venomoth is now able to outspeed again, hitting Psychic on turn 4 to get the KO and get me out of Tilted Towers. By the way, I just saw on Twitter that they're adding Snake and uh, Peter Griffin to Fortnite? I swear, Smash Bros with guns has gone too far. Anyway, now that we can access Fuchsia City with the power of flute technology, we can grab those last two secret techniques, opening up the remaining encounters of the game. First up, Tentacool on Route 19, giving me access to a very handy water type in the face of many rock and ground types that's pretty darn fast, albeit pretty frail in the physical department, so I better be one shotting Next up is down in the Pokemon Mansion with Grimer, and thankfully right here on Cinnabar Island is a trade for an Alolan Grimer, giving me that ever-elusive dark subtyping. However, the downside here is that he trades you a static level 44 Alolan Grimer, regardless of what level Cantonian Grimer you send in return, meaning I cannot level up this thing one time to evolve it into Muck before Sabrina without going over the level cap. Well, better to have an immunity pivot to lead into something that can outspeed and KO a psychic type rather than nothing at all. With the Lolan Grimer in hand though, that's all the available poison type encounters here in Let's Go Pikachu. So let's bum rush self company so that I can get to those rapid fire for gym battles. First up, Blue with Executor, which you think would be a problem, but thanks to Beedrill's Pin Missile, I am able to easily one shot this with a 3 hit combo, KOing and leaving just Charizard. Of course, we have the swap here, using our newly evolved Tentacruel to tank a Heat Wave with plenty of HP to spare, but thanks to Air Slash getting a crit and a flinch, as well as Slash bringing Tentacruel into the red, Surf is just barely unable to KO, leaving me to risk swapping into Nidoking. Thankfully, this pays off though as he survives an Air Slash Heat Wave combo to connect with a Thunderbolt to finish him off. A little rough, but that flinch did not help matters, though at least I didn't succumb to it. Second of four important Sylph Co. fights is of course the double battle against Archer and a female Rocket Grunt, and this is just hilarious. So because Electrode cannot do anything against our ground-type Nidoking and Cubone, he just decides to go kaboom and take himself out, but the damage output is so absolutely terrible that Nidoking, Cubone, and the ally Muck barely take any damage from it, all while taking out a Pokemon for free as Dig is used on the Electrode slot. A little unfortunate, but that's fine as Cubone's Bone Meringue brings Muck down into the red, all while Weezing enters the field second for Archer. He of course blocks Dig with Protect, making me shy away as Cubone KOs Muck with a second Bone Meringue through Minimize. Very well done, you literal child. You've redeemed yourself from the last LGP Nuzlocke's transgressions. 
Second out for the grunt is Raticate, so I decided to pivot towards KOing it, using a single double kick to do so all while taking Flamethrower from Weezing for some decent damage, but with Dig out speeding I should be able to KO in tandem with Cubone this turn. Is what I would say if it weren't for Weezing actually targeting Cubone with the Flamethrower, KOing it thanks to the Toxic Poison he received a few turns back and leading into Pidgeot. Thankfully, Dig does hit next turn with no protect, but a consequential miss with Air Slash leads to a critical flamethrower that burns Nidoking. And though we did break out of the burn with the power of friendship, Nidoking's at too low of HP to stay in, so I swap into Tentacruel as Weezing goes for protect, only to be taken out by Scald next turn, leaving just Golbat. It's a pretty easy Scald and Air Slash combo to bring it well below half, taking a single Air Slash before finally KOing with a second Scald to bring this battle to a close. Gotta love how long double battles take to describe, it's <laughs> just so much to keep up with. At least the Jesse and James fights are short and sweet with only Arbok and Weezing to worry about though. Leading Nidoking and Venomoth once again, we're going for that perfect super effective combo of Dig and Psychic, doing half to Arbok on turn 1 as both Glare and Flamethrower missed at both targeting Nidoking. Huh, I uh, would have expected Flamethrower to go towards Venomoth, but I'll take it. As Dig KOs Arbok and Psychic does over half damage to Weezing, finally landing a Flamethrower for slightly under half on Venomoth, but it's nowhere near enough as Thrash from Nidoking next turn takes out Weezing, leaving just Giovanni. This squad has been doing great work so far, so let's keep it up as he leads Persian, I lead Nidoking, taking Fake Out and Slash before delivering Double Kick for over half, but thanks to a second non-crit Slash, I KO with the second Double Kick, all while taking less than half damage. Then doing the same Golbat play that we did in our first battle, by swapping into Rhyhorn's Drill Run, only to KO with Mega Drain. All that remains is Nidoqueen, and we seem to be pacing Body Slam's damage with Mega Drain pretty well, not getting paralyzed through three Body Slams, and allowing for Mega Drain to get the four-shot KO to win the fight. Can't complain about that one, short and sweet. One item hunt later, including literally four TMs in the entire building, I don't know why they put so many in here, but I can finally take on the last four gym leaders of Kanto. First up, Koga and his poison types for a near mirror match, albeit with me having a much more superior team in comparison. I decided to swap around my team and bring in Nidoqueen and Gengar over Venusaur and Beedrill, since the additional ground type will help for super effective damage, and Gengar's just generally fast and has access to Psychic, so this theoretically should go very well. Koga leads Weezing, and I go with Gengar to blank Explosion, just going for Psychic to nearly one-shot as Sludge Bomb does next to nothing, KOing next turn with Shadow Ball as his bomb Venomoth comes in second. I had a feeling this would come early, seeing as it has Psychic, but being able to get off a Psychic with Gengar is huge, surviving a Psychic itself at red HP, but getting Venomoth down to low enough HP to where we don't trigger a healing item, and get the chance to send in this specially bulky Tentacruel to clean up the KO with Scald is perfect. Third out is Golbat, which I think I can outspeed and go for Surf, hitting for half as we protect next turn against Fly, being blocked by Golbat's own protect for a turn, but the second Surf cleans it up as Muck comes out last. Nothing really much for Muck to do other than weak sludge bombs, so I'm just going for Surf and Scald, getting a burn that helps speed up the clock, but we're eventually able to take it out after being brought to red HP off of sludge bomb, hitting one last Surf to seal the deal and win our fifth gym badge. Next up is Sabrina, so once again I shifted the team around, taking out Nidoqueen, Venomoth, and Golbat for Venusaur, Vileplume, and Alolan Grimer for the best advantage that I can get in terms of type matchups, and of course that precious dark type immunity pivot, plus screens and leech seed from Venusaur as well as sped up potential with Vileplume's growth, though I don't think I'll need that one as Venusaur also has growth. Sabrina leads Mr. Mime, I go with Venusaur, and this is purely to set up Leech Seed on a screen turn. But of course, we miss the 90% accurate move on turn 1. Well, shoot, I guess I'm going for it anyway. Venusaur is especially bulky enough and does outspeed Mr. Mime, so I may as well. I'm sure we can survive effectively 1.5 Psychics once Light Screen is up next turn. But thanks to the power of friendship, it's as if our miss never happened as Psychic is dodged, allowing me to set up Light Screen before it even gets to hit it. It does around a quarter afterwards, letting Venusaur heal a bit off of Leech Seed, and now letting me set up growth. I figure if we can get off a few, set up one last light screen before Mr. Mime goes down, and just go to town with Petal Dance, then this battle will go great. Mr. Mime does get off another light screen, as do I, but with him also setting up Reflect for no reason, it's as good a time as any for me to set up my last few growths, though with Mr. Mime's last Psychic managing to get a special defense drop before going down to Leech Seed damage, I might be in a little bit of trouble. 
Alas, we do have plus six. Venusaur is actually relatively fast in comparison to Jinx and Slowbro, and out comes Slowbro second, so that's an easy Petal Dance KO, leading to Jinx third, who also goes down to Petal Dance. Thank goodness, by the way, we got the fatigue after only the second attack. I'm pretty sure Venusaur would have just gone down here if not for that, but with this, I can pivot over to Grimer for the Psychic Immunity, leaving Alakazam with only Nightshade as an attacking move, and with that brittle defense, one crunch is more than enough to take it out, giving me the Marsh Badge. Six down, two to go, and I'm sure it's no surprise that the team has once again been shifted around in preparation for Blaine, taking out Venusaur and Vileplume for Golbat and Nidoqueen. And while Golbat isn't really the best choice, it's better than a Grass-type weak to fire. Plus, having ground types as a two-of and a water-type for Blaine just seems like the obvious choice. It's not like I'm throwing my two Grass-types and two Bug-types in this fight after all, so these are all of the viable options I have. Though admittedly, with Tentacruel outspeeding Magmar and hitting Surf on turn 1 and nearly KO, I'm feeling pretty comfortable until seeing Confuse Ray. Eh, I don't want to risk it, so I swap over to Nidoking to tank a Flamethrower for less than half, finishing it off with Double Kick as Rapidash is in second. I'm pretty sure just seeing Flare Blitz here, so I just use Protect to confirm, and yep, that's it. So why not go out into Nidoqueen? We should be able to take this with over half HP remaining, and sure enough I can, taking a second before firing off Dig and KOing next turn. Not bad, but with Arcanine in third, I'm in a pretty rough spot. I use Protect to see what he goes for here, and sure enough, it's Flare Blitz. Theoretically, I should be able to take that with Tentacruel, but wow, our physical defense is ass. No shot I survive an Outrage from here. I gotta swap again, this time into Muck as my most physically defensive wall, taking two Outrages before going for Foul Play to take advantage of his high attack stat. Doing well over half before once again swapping into Golbat and hoping for a Confusion self-hit here off of the Fatigue, and we get it, awesome. Now that Golbat swapped in safely, I can stay in and hit a Sludge Bomb to finish it off, though Flare Blitz burning is a little irritating. Last out is Ninetales, and with that special attacking Fire Blast coming out, Tentacruel is able to jump back in, use Surf for over half, taking a second Fire Blast, and allowing me to squirt out one more Surf to KO and take the W. Ugh, uh, even with the context of water, the word squirt just doesn't sit well with me. No, oh, well, I already said it twice, can't go back to fix it. One more gym battle to go, and if you haven't guessed it, I adjusted my team for a fourth time in a row. This time taking out both Nidoking and Nidoqueen for my two grass types in Venusaur and Vileplume. Once again, this is for subtype purposes and the potential screen and leech seed set up by Venusaur. First out is Doug Trio, so I lead off with Venusaur's Reflect, not outspeeding, but managing to dodge Earthquake by the power of friendship. Only to do so again next turn as I go for Petal Dance. I mean, I... Well, take it, I'm not gonna complain about not taking damage, but still, kinda bullshit. Second out is Nidoking, who uses Earthquake for only about a quarter as Petal Dance does over half, though we do get the second turn fatigue rather than the three turn, so I'm forced to swap. I go into Tentacruel here since we can theoretically survive a non-crit Earthquake and outspeed the KO with Surf, and sure enough, it goes according to plan, leaving two more team members. Third out is Nidoqueen, and I'm not risking Earthquake here, so I swap into Golbat to blank it before firing off Confuse Ray only now having to deal with Crunch, which does about the same amount of damage as my Fly is doing. Probably not the best move choice considering my stats and nature, so I shift to using Mega Drain, taking it out after a few turns and surviving on over half HP. And why not? Let's do the hat trick by using Mega Drain once more on Rhydon, 2KO it in one shot to win the fight. It's pretty poetic seeing this thing finished off with the same Pokemon, using the same attack each time, all while the strategy remained completely effective, despite our apparent weakness to Rock. Chuck another tally up to this specially offensive goal bat. All that remains is our last rival battle, one victory road in the Pokemon League, so it's time for major preparation. I did make sure to round up more TMs from across the region to ensure I had my best matchup possible against Trace, though I will have to clean up victory road to make sure everyone is completely optimized. For Trace himself, I figured there's no need to swap around this team for the first time in a while, instead just going straight for it. Trace leads Pidgeot and myself with Muck, attempting to use Ice Punch, but just getting utterly walled by Air Slash and Sand Attack. Not connecting for two turns in a row, as Ice Punch does half, but with Roost on Pidgeot, it's a pretty futile effort, which is why I have Brick Break. Since Roost removes that Flying type, I can effectively try to stall it out until I miss with Brick Break. Shifting back to Ice Punch, but after missing a whole bunch and flinching off of Air Slash, I'll chalk this up to bad RNG and swap to Gengar, only to be outsped and hit with Sand Attack. This is literally the slowest Gengar ever. I've never seen one of these be outsped by a Pidgeot, but here we are, I guess. At least Thunderbolt connects and KOs, leading to Jolteon. 
I figure Thunder is going to hurt like a truck, so I swap in a Venusaur to take two of them for less than half damage as Earthquake nearly KOs. But now that Jolteon's effectively heal locked with a full restore coming in hot, a third Thunder only brings Venusaur slightly under half before another Earthquake finishes it off, leading to Marowak. Pedal Dance does that in effectively, but with Vileplume out last, it barely does anything at all, while Fatigue sets in and Vileplume sets up an Acid and misses to do the power of friendship. Not a problem, it's just a quick jump over to Golbat, who's finally learned Air Slash and can take this plant down in two shots to give me the win, despite that pretty rocky start. I really thought Muck would carry through Pidgeot, but I guess I was pretty wrong for thinking that. One victory road later, and with preparations complete, here's what my entire squad of 10 Pokemon are looking like. I know it's weird to prep anybody outside of the main six I'm bringing into the league, but with the Pokemon box being accessible while inside the league, I figured it would be understandable if I prepared the other four Pokemon, just in the event that a battle goes drastically wrong and I have to fill in multiple team slots, though I'm gonna try my best not to do that, even if I have a death or two throughout these fights. Do you think I'll take the win? Leave a comment below, and if so, how many deaths? But with that, it's league time. First up, Lorelei leads with Dugong, and I go with Venomoth. And considering I have access to both Quiverdance and Roost, you know what time it is. Dugong is just a terribly statted Pokemon, making it pretty easy to only take half damage from two waterfalls, all while outspeeding and setting up two Quiver Dances, eventually setting up six of them in due time, finally finishing off with two Roosts to get me back at full HP, Eh, before being knocked down to 75% again, using Psychic to... Uh, not one shot. Yeah, I told you that adamant nature was gonna bite me in the ass later on. Thankfully though, after another roost, we get a dodge thanks to the power of friendship, allowing for me to go into the rest of Lorelei's team with nearly full HP after another Psychic KO's Dugong. Second out is Jinx, so I shift to Bug Buzz to KO in one shot, doing the same to Slowbro out third, leading to Cloyster, who goes down to one shot of Psychic thanks to its paper-thin special defense, leaving just Lapras to go down to two Psychics following a single Hydro Pump for minimal damage. To be expected from that fight, usually Lorelei is a pushover if you have a Pokemon capable of setup sweeping, along with consistent healing, so Venomoth was perfect. Now for Bruno, this is a pretty cut and dry battle. I lead Tentacruel against Onix to one-shot it with Surf, with Machamp out second and guaranteed to go for Earthquake. So I swap to Golbat to blank the attack, going for Air Slash for well over half as Rock Slide connects for around 75%. So to keep myself as healthy as possible, I decide to go for Roost three times here to eliminate my flying typing as the AI is too dumb to notice the pattern and go for Earthquake, letting me get up to around 70% as a second Air Slash connects, KOing and leading to Hitmonlee. Considering this guy has Rock Slide, it's back out to Tentacruel to absorb that for around a third, landing a critical hit Surf and dodging a Rock Slide so that the second Surf can KO, with Hitmonchan coming out to attempt to hit a super effective Thunder Punch, effectively blocked by Protect. Oddly enough though, Hitmonchan only has three elemental punches as its moveset. As do almost all of the other Pokemon in the league, why do they only have three moves on their moveset? Well, at least it makes it easier for the AI to choose good moves. Anyway, it's easier for me to bring in Muck here and just three-shot it with Brick Break while taking a myriad of the elemental punches, living on a hair over a quarter as Polyrath comes in last. It attempts to use Super Power as I swap into Venusaur and dodge it, taking minimal damage from the second one as two Mega Drains seal the deal. Despite the chunky number of Earthquake users on that team, I think that went about as well as we could have hoped for. Pivots worked, played around crits as much as possible, couldn't ask for better execution. Third up is Agatha, and Nidoking is just a house against her. Thanks to access to Fast Earthquake, I'm able to one-shot her lead Arbok immediately without threat of being hit with Glare, but setting up for her first Gengar. Now, this has Will-O-Wisp, so it makes no sense for me to stay in. Rather, I go into the Dark-type Muck that the burn shouldn't hurt too much for in terms of using Crunch allowing for it to still be a two-shot as Sludge Bomb is volleyed at me for minimal damage, though the burn takes me just above half as Weezing enters third, letting me get off a dig for... Oh, wow, yeah, okay, that burn is doing something. But considering this was also a test to see if Weezing was going for Thunderbolt, surely enough, that was the case, so I'm able to safely pivot back over into Nidoking, eliminating it with two Earthquakes, all while taking a light Shadow Ball leading to Golbat. Now, I made sure to teach Nidoking the Rock Slide TM just for this fight, KOing with two of them as Air Slash only connects once, leaving just the final Gengar to attempt to retaliate for his fallen comrades, only doing around half of Nidoking's current HP with Shadow Ball, before a nasty Earthquake ruins his day, KOing and giving me the third Deathless win of the Elite Four. 
deathless run so far, two battles to go, and I don't really want to jinx it. I think this could certainly be possible, considering Lance's lead is a special attacking Cedra, and Venomoth is just what the doctor ordered for taking care of it. Once again, by alternating between Roost and Quiver Dance, I'm easily able to outpace Cedra's damage. Literally getting Dragon Pulse to do only around 11 damage once all six are set up. Finally roosting to get as much HP advantage as I can before KOing it with Bug Buzz. Now with the rest of them being flying types, Psychic is going to have to do a lot of heavy lifting as Aerodactyl is out second. And damn it! That adamant nature is certainly screwing me over. Psychic just barely misses the one shot here as Rock Slide brings Venomoth into the red, and seeing as we're taking super effective damage from the bug typing rather than a flying typing, there's no way I can outpace that damage with Roost, requiring me to commit into a second Psychic to KO as Gyarados enters third. Now this is a nasty physical attacker, and I don't think I want to be handling that with Venomoth just being out here with red HP. So instead, I swap into Venusaur to tank a Waterfall, taking a third as I set up Leech Seed, only to see Iron Tail. Oh then, yeah, that's pretty good, but with the second one getting a defense drop following a Mega Drain, and getting Gyarados to around half HP, I figure there's no reason to not swap into Nidoking, King, considering it's Iron Tail again, retrieving some of that HP back with Leech Seed before finishing it off with Thunder Punch, leading to Charizard. Now this thing immediately outspeeds and goes for Hyper Beam, but since it only did around 60%, a quad effective critical rock slide is the most overkill I could possibly do, leaving just the most threatening Pokemon on the team, Dragonite. Now, Outrage is a wild move here, hitting even a Lolan Muck for over half. From here, though, I'm thinking I can bring in Tentacruel on the potential last turn of Outrage, only managing to live at 1 HP. This was not a power of friendship moment either, considering Tentacruel just straight up survives, I'm able to fire off an Ice Beam. Unfortunately, it did not KO, and the last Outrage is able to hit before Fatigue sets in, screwing me out of a deathless run. Though this does let me bring in Nidoking to finish the battle with Ice Punch, outspeed into KO, it put me only one fight away from victory. With only five party members though, and one of them being one of the most integral typings for resistances in water, I might just be a little bit toast, though I think I can pull through. He leads off with Pidgeot as I go with Venomoth, and seeing as Pidgeot is a special attacker, even with Mega Evolution, even with super effective attacks, I'm able to outspeed and begin setting up with Quiver Dance, dodging an Air Slash as the second is set up, with Air Slash doing nearly half. Oh jeez, I think I need to do Roost now just to see if I can bait for a second miss here. Though that doesn't end up happening, and turns out that was a low roll Air Slash, starting to take more damage from high rolls, and... I don't think my brain registered that and thought he just got two max rolls back to back. So I went for a third Quiver Dance, expecting that special defense boost to be enough. Uh oh, I'm down to a 4-6 to six deficit already and I haven't even touched this Pidgeot. Hopefully I can do something to fix this. I have to go with Muck here, using Rock Slide for nearly half before shifting to Ice Punch next turn to try not knocking him into full restore range, but instead I actually managed to nail an incoming Marowak on the switch for just under half HP. Unintentional predictions come in handy, I suppose, but that forces me to swap into Golbat to ensure I just don't die to Bone Meringue. So I do so and blank the attack, hitting Air Slash for half of Marowak's remaining HP as he lands a pretty pathetic Fire Punch. All good though, as I can just go for it again, only to now see him swap into Jolteon. Hmm, I think we do have a good perfect pivot into Nidoking here, blanking Thunder and getting hit with only a light quick attack before Vileplume is able to come in next after it of course dies to Earthquake. I suppose neutral Solar Beam is going to hurt pretty hard here, so I instead go back into Golbat only for it to take about a quarter, leaving me to just hit it with Confuse Ray, set up a Roost, dodge with the power of Friendship, and finally lay in with Air Slash to get the two-shot KO. Glad we're back on even playing field here with 4 versus 4, though with Slowbro out third, it's right back out into Muck as Light Screen is used. I was kind of hoping to swap into a Psychic there, but that's fine. We get hit with Surf to bring me to half HP, just to KO with two crunches as Rapidash enters fourth. For this one, I don't really know what the best strategy is, but using Earthquake certainly seems like one of them. I think it involves staying in with Muck only to hit a Rock Slide, but thanks to that not one-shotting and Flare Blitz being able to land, I figure swapping into Nidoking King would be wise at this juncture. Though apparently Trace for the third time in this battle opts to swap for Marowak on the same turn, which just eats an Ice Punch to KO from Nidoking, bringing back the much damaged Rapidash. Thankfully though, because he decided to swap on normally what would be a full restore turn, 
he full restores, and I'm able to one-shot from full with Earthquake. With the AI trying to be big brain with all of these switching shenanigans, it definitely kind of screwed him over here. It leaves just Mega Pidgeot, and while Rock Slide did really get close to KOing, with the full restores as well as Ruse, that's making it quite difficult, especially backed by flinching from Air Slash. Well, uh, I think I'm just staying in and hoping I can dodge an Air Slash, and if we don't, I can at least get a swap into either Golbat or Venusaur for free to finish this fight off. Though, with the power of friendship, Nidoking does survive on 1 HP and delivers another Rock Slide that... It just barely doesn't KO. Are you kidding me? Ranges are just being this pedantic in the potential final moments of this run for what reason? Uh, well, I'm still committing, going for Thunder Punch and somehow dodging the last Air Slash, getting the Thunder Punch to KO and win the fight. <laughs> I guess Nidoking must have been imbued with the power of Hulkamania, the spirit of the Ultimate Warrior, and the Macho Madness all at the same time to withstand that beating, but I will 100% take it. Either that, or I'm just delirious reading this script, considering I've been awake for 24 hours now, trying to pump out this video on time, and nonsensical Ultimate Warrior promos were enough to cure drowsiness. But I digress. This run was... fine. I mean, considering there was a lot of overlap with the last two typings I've done in Grass with Venusaur and Vileplume, as well as Flying with Golbat, there were quite a few things here that allowed me to recycle some ideas, even with Venomoth being a kind of a comparison into Butterfree with the last run with flying types, albeit not as effectively as we saw here. But with that said, thank you guys so much for watching. If you'd like to check out another video of mine, click one on screen, you'll probably enjoy it too. Make sure to subscribe, like this video, and ring the bell to get alerted to every time I upload as I'm going hard this month to hopefully reach the goal of 200,000 subscribers by the end of the year. But with that, stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you next time.